I'm slightly relieved, I have to say, that Bill Bryson has gone because uh, I need to reveal that I do a really mean Iowan accent and I've been hanging around Bristol Temple Mead Station for the last four months. Um, uh, and it's also a pleasure to be introduced by Lucy uh, as well because I'm on the Cathedral Council of St. Paul's uh, and of course that's where Lucy was uh, canon before going to St. James. And there is, if you ever get the chance to go into uh, the chapter house, um, up in the most extraordinary dining room, meeting room, there's a most amazing uh, portrait of you. Um, and so when we have our Cathedral Council meetings, as we will in next Thursday evening, Lucy looks down on us spiritually, metaphorically, and physically as we go about our deliberations and talk about money. Now, you'll notice that um, none of these are cathedrals, but they are the members of ALVA, the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions. Our members uh, represent about 118 million day visits per year. That's about 30% of all day visits made in the whole of the UK, which is why we're able to get meetings with the Chancellor and the PM and the Home Secretary and monthly meetings with the Culture Secretary, as we do. Um, and I just want to really pick up on pilgrims and strangers and shaping our visitor offer. Um, but before I do, I want you to be inspired by this, which actually looks better on my laptop than it does uh, in this room. Um, uh, and you can distribute this PowerPoint presentation, by the way. This is Northern Lights, and it's a beautiful, stunning light projection onto the ceiling in the nave of York Minster, just two weeks ago, as part of their fundraising uh, efforts. Um, utterly gorgeous, looks so much better on a laptop, so do Google it while I'm talking, I won't take offense in the slightest. We're good at tourism in the UK, we're globally good. Uh, and it has been one of those industries that we've often taken uh, sort of no particular recognition of. And, and yet, actually, it's stunningly important to every community and every constituency in all parts of the United Kingdom. It's our fifth biggest industry in the UK. It's our third largest employer. It's worth £157 billion to the economy. And even in the teeth of recession and austerity, it created one in three of all new jobs and still creates one in four of all new jobs now. We're good at tourism in the UK. We're globally good. And I love these statistics about actually how popular we are, not just to domestic visitors, us Brits, but also overseas visitors as well, who come here principally, regardless of their country of origin or their gender or their age, they come here principally for our heritage and our history and our traditions, which is your get-out-of-jail card. And then after that, they come for a whole series of different reasons, and it could be business or football or sport or art or whatever. Principally, the number one motivating factor for people coming to the UK is history, heritage, and tradition. And this is also an example of how popular we are. This is just Scotland. So the top 10 most visited visitor attractions in Scotland combined still get more visitors than the whole of Australia and New Zealand combined. And then this is probably my favorite uh, statistic. Whoops, sorry. More people visit heritage properties in the UK every weekend than attend football matches, 32 times more than att attend Premier League games. The great advantage of that is that you don't have to change your kit every year for 60 quid um, or be slightly embarrassed about the travails of whoever the manager is at a particular time. Um, I was asked to talk about um, what do visitors want and it's quite, it's quite difficult because the motivations for individuals of going to churches or indeed cathedrals or abbeys or some of our great churches is very, very different. But through the data that we collect from all of our members, and our members include all of the visitor attractions, each of which get more than a million visitors per year. So the National Trust through to English Heritage from the British Library through to uh, Harry Potter, uh, the making of Harry Potter at Warner Brothers Studios, through to the Eden Project in Edinburgh Castle, the Royal Collection in Historic Royal Palaces. Um, we take all of their data, their visitor numbers, but also try and determine what it is that their visitors want. What are the motivating factors for them going to one of those visitor attractions? 
And things keep on coming through with amazing regularity. What they want when they come to you is value for money, even if money is not a consideration, even if they don't have to pay to go into your premises. So what I mean by that is that, what's the time now? It's five past, it's five past 10. Within an hour and a quarter, I could be at City Airport, and by half past 12, I could be in one of 15 European capital cities. The world has never been smaller. The world is our oyster. Our tourism opportunities are almost limitless. We have, arguably, in our retired community, the richest generation there's ever been in the UK. We can make informed choices about where we go and how we spend our time and how we spend our money. And yet, people cross your threshold given the choice of the rest of the world. How genuinely extraordinary. So they may not be passing money as they pass your threshold, but they're giving over their time. And they want value for that time too. They also want to experience, to learn and be surprised. This I'm going to come on to a little later. They want to stand on the spot where history happened and they want to feel the authenticity of place reeking around them. Reeking in a good sense. And they want to remember their visit and be invited back and be incited back too. And I'm just going to unpick briefly some of these things. So value for money. Um, I spoke uh, earlier this year at the Association of English Cathedrals uh, conference and I, I posed the question, why is it that you charge the same amount of money for someone entering your cathedral at 11 o'clock in the morning as you do in 4 o'clock in the afternoon? When at 11 o'clock in the morning, they can conceivably be there for six hours. At four o'clock in the afternoon, conceivably be there for 45 minutes. If dynamic pricing is good enough for EasyJet and Hotels.com and Ryanair, why should we be immune from it in the tourism sector too? The second, money can't buy experiences, yet yeah, funnily enough it can. Um, here, at, here at St. Paul's, we have just appropriated this on behalf of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, at St. Paul's, um, one of the things that we're uh, in daily discussion about is how we raise the requisite money to keep the cathedral going. And increasingly, our fundraising and development team are coming up with really amazing, innovative, novel ways of, of fundraising, and they include behind the scenes tours to uh, the, um, the great model, Christopher Wren's great model, or Schweiz. Forum, which unlike Westminster Abbey isn't open yet, um, or to um, the Hogwarts-like Wren Library. And people are prepared to pay big money for that private, guided, personal tour by a historian or an advocate, um, or someone just genuinely passionate who can communicate through their storytelling what is important and what's special about these places. Time-specific experiences. Um, I remember uh, about seven or eight years ago now, um, uh, the coronation chair was being conserved in public view in Westminster Abbey. And sure, I, you know, it's the coronation chair. This isn't just a, a regular chair. But while it was being conserved, it was being conserved in a kind of um, a pop-up studio with a big window in it. So you could see the conservator working away and you could go and watch and watch conservation and restoration happening. During the time that the coronation chair was being restored, the greatest dwell time of any part of the abbey was in front of the conservation taking place. So not the Cosmati pavement in front of the high altar, not the Henry VII chapel, not the tomb of Elizabeth I or Mary Queen of Scots. It was watching someone do stuff to something. Don't hide your restoration and conservation away. People love seeing those skills visible in front of them and to see the passion, enthusiasm and the skills and expertise that we often take for granted. And allow people to buy locally or to tap into their innate philanthropy. One of the things that we found during austerity and recession was that visitors, particularly us Brits, prioritised going to our local visitor attractions, local museums, local galleries, at the expense of going to the national ones. And when asked, 
two things came back. One is, I genuinely don't trust the weather. You know, if you think, um, well, there were three actually. One, I don't trust the weather. If it turns bad, I want to get home quickly. Two, and this is quite a London specific thing, I don't trust Southern Rail, but we'll park that <laughs> for a second. Um, but the third, and this is the first time this has ever come out, was that if I'm going to spend my money, I want to spend it in the local community. And that enlightened sense of philanthropy had never really been evident before, but it was coming out now, and it absolutely tips, uh, tops into what Dame Caroline has been talking about in terms of I may not go to the church, but I want it to be there. I want it to be open. Um, second observation um, is to learn, to experience, and be surprised. Uh, I was in Exeter um, last Monday, and I had about an hour to kill before my meeting at the cathedral and then going to the railway station, where I pretended to be uh, an American well-known author. And one of the things uh, that I did was just walk down the high street, and I popped into, and I can't for the life of me now remember the name of it, but a newly restored, does anyone know the new name of the newly restored ancient church in the middle of Exeter High Street? It's absolutely beautiful. Um, St. Stephen's? Gorgeous, and relatively new as well, so I think it's been refurbished in the last year or so, recently. Um, absolutely fantastic. What I could do, though, was culturally snack. I could pop in, and I didn't feel, as I sometimes feel when going to a museum or a gallery, or indeed, dare I say, a cathedral, that there was an obligation on my part to stay there for three hours and read everything and learn everything and then be spat out at the end. This, for me, was cultural snacking. Popping in, having a look round, going. Do your, cult, do your churches allow for cultural snacking? Are you okay with people popping in in their lunchtime for 10 minutes as opposed to an obligatory hour or to read everything? Can you just pop in? Again, one of the things that we find at St. Paul's is their first experience, one of awe and wonder or transaction and gift aid. Um, and this is something that we're... Well, we were talking about it when you were a canon uh, in the chapter. Um, and, and it's something that we haven't um, uh, quite addressed yet, but there are, there's a project uh, underfoot. But what is the first impression that you give to someone walking through your door, across your threshold? Is it welcome? Is it awe? Is it wonder? Or is it, can you gift aid while you're here? That transactional relationship. Um, and do you thank them when they leave? Again, within two hours, I could be in 14 capital cities. The, my choice of going to visitor attractions is almost endless. And yet, of all the places that are open to me, I've chosen to come to you to spend my time and my money with you. What an enormous honor and privilege that is. And do you say thank you to them for doing it? And that's not purely about politeness or etiquette. That's about bottom line and business and P&L. Because we know that if someone has had a good experience going to St. James, for example, in Piccadilly, they're about 56% likely to recommend that to a friend. But if they've gone into St. James in Piccadilly and music has been playing, it was the first place, by the way, when I was 18, that I heard um, Vaughan Williams' variation on a theme of Thomas Tallis, and it stuck with me ever since, and I can now absolutely see the building as I hear that music. It's visceral, it's physical, uh, it's in the soul. Do you say thank you? Because if you've had that welcome experience, thank you for coming, is this your first time here? Thank you so much for coming, do come again. Did you know that we do amazing Christmas markets? Come back in winter. The propensity to recommend to someone to go and visit increases by another 20% to 76%. Now that's not just about etiquette, that's not just about courtesy, that's about business, and that's about bottom line. Blenheim Palace. So Blenheim Palace, uh, given to the first Duke of Marlborough by Queen Anne on behalf of a grateful nation. Uh, building by Sir John Vanbrugh, uh, gardens by Capability Brown. Uh, the only non-religious, non-royal palace in the UK. Crystal Palace doesn't count, so don't even quibble. Um, and stunning. 
Petitions, state bedrooms, state banquets, a Rembrandt, two Vermeers. And if you went 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, or 50 years ago, it hasn't particularly changed, because that's slightly the point of a stately home. So why would you go back? And this was the challenge that, that the trustees of Blenheim Palace and the current Duke of Marlborough faced. Why would you go back if you went, as I did, seven? Well, it hasn't actually fundamentally changed. So, they commissioned the Chinese dissident artist Ai Weiwei, when he was under house arrest in Beijing, to do this, to put contemporary sculpture on the lawn, to put in temporarily for seven months chandeliers which are a bit more Harvey Nichols than they are John Vanbrugh, uh, ceramics which are more Coca-Cola and Banksy than they are Wedgwood, and Durham Cathedral, working with Artichoke uh, as part of their Lumiere series now for eight years, I think it is. What's the, what's the um, similarity between these two very, very different projects? The average age of people going to them while these projects were on was 25 years younger than people who'd go to the normal building during a normal day. They spent three times more money in retail and catering much more likely to convert to membership there and then at the moment of greatest emotional impact, and much, much more likely to upload images like these onto social media. Like this. Um, now again, this looks better on a laptop than it does in this beautifully lit, but frustratingly beautifully lit room. This is the nave of Durham Cathedral, and if you could try and work it out. These are sort of hanging lights, so they're a bit like the candles in Hogwarts. Harry Potter, by the way, is not the extent of my cultural references. But these are, the, these, are, these are like hanging lights from the nave. Actually, they're illuminated miners' vests. Not a sentence I've ever used before. They're illuminated miners' vests to convey the importance of the mining community to the prosperity of the northeast of England. I mean, absolutely beautiful and stunning and poetic and algaic. One of the other things that, that we found, and particularly at times of recession and austerity, and I would argue now political instability, is that because the future looks so unpredictable and daunting and scary, the past, in contrast, becomes safe and reassuring and comfortable and nostalgic. Now, you know and I know that nostalgia can play two ways, uh, but in this case it's safe and warm. And it's not just visitors who reflect this phenomena. Um, every time there's a recession and austerity, visits to stately homes, national trust properties, and English heritage properties go up. And at times of uh, prosperity, they go down slightly. People want to be reminded of their past because the future is so uncertain and predictable. And it's not just us in the tourism sector who uh, are influenced by this. Downton Abbey, upstairs, downstairs, who do you think you are, which is genealogical tourism, Great British Bake Off, Great British Sewing Bee, which is all about the acquisition of skills lost to a couple of generations. You need to, uh, Sainsbury's and Waitrose and Marks and Spencer's start prioritizing homemade, homemade, simple pies and food. Hemlines change during a session of austerity. Oddly, um, purchases of lipstick and Prosecco go up. To, to soften the blow, I, I assume. Um, but all of these things happen, and actually the Downton Abbey one is a really interesting one. When Downton Abbey was first broadcast, uh, Chatsworth and Blenheim Palace started getting bad TripAdvisor reviews for the first time. Why? It's because people watching Downton Abbey on a Sunday night saw both the upstairs, Vermeers, Titian's, Rembrandt, Money, but actually, they could more readily empathize with downstairs, because that's where their family would have been 100 years ago. Now, Blenheim Palace and Chatsworth didn't have that downstairs story, because their kitchens and their servants' quarters and all of their rooms were actually given over to storage. They've now had to change and provide that downstairs experience in the light of people's expectations about Downton Abbey, a fictional competition uh, in the light of that. Are we doing the same kind of thing? Uh, do you um, tell your stories with passion and flair and allow your volunteers to inspire without making it up? Because I think we've all been there. 
And here's um, a non-ecclesiastical example, but I think it's, I think it's a good one. It's, it's a telling one. This is Shakespeare's birthplace house. This is where Shakespeare was born. Um, it was uh, his father's house. His father was a glover and would make the gloves in the equivalent of the kitchen and sell them out of the front window onto the high street in Stratford-on-Avon. These flagstones are original. These are the flagstones where Shakespeare learned to crawl and walk and speak and learn the alphabet and write. And every day, including today, Overseas visitors, mainly, and mainly from China and in India, and I don't know why, take off their shoes and socks to stand on the flagstones where Shakespeare learnt to write. To have a, a physical, almost umbilical link with the past, with something greater than them, with someone global, with someone with a global impact. And that sense of wanting to connect with history and something that bigger than yourself is just your get out of jail card for ecclesiastical tourism. This is the spot. This is the place. Now, the greatest dwell time at Westminster Abbey for the last two weeks has been the grave and the ashes uh, of um, uh, Stephen Hawking. We want to connect with people. We want to feel a connection with people greater than ourselves. And more and more, church tourism or cathedral tourism is taking more risks, being braver and more confident and more assertive. So you all know that Dippy, the famous Diplodocus from the Natural History Museum, is currently on tour. Uh, it's approved. I mean, he hasn't gone wandering. Um, and it's currently at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. I say he, I mean, I don't know. Um, actually, it turns out it's not even a proper dinosaur. It's a, it's a Victorian cast. But don't tell the kids, because it will ruin their Christmas. Um, and it ends up in the nave of Norwich Cathedral in 2020. Now, this is extraordinary for a cathedral, actually. They've had some letters from creationists, but like Southern Rail, we'll park that for a second. Um, but, but brave and confident and assertive. And they're thinking about doing this, which the Natural History Museum did when Dippy was there in the now Heights Hall, which is sleepovers. Uh, adults can do it too. I can't see the attraction myself, but, um, but kids absolutely love it. Now, this is interesting. I mean, Dino snores for kids. I mean, genius marketing for a start. But look at this. 60 quid per child. Um, one of the interesting things, when I was talking to Mike Dixon, who's the director of the Natural History Museum, I said, without being overly Royston Vasey about it, is that London prices for London people? He said, actually, no. It's about 60% of all of those, these are sold out, by the way, and it goes up to £140 at Christmas. Uh, you get dinner, but they're really big on the breakfast thing. Um, uh, completely sold out. 60% of all of the people who buy the tickets are not from London. They're traveling from elsewhere in the UK. I said, that's extraordinary, that's an amazing prize. What do you put that down to? He said, actually, what I put it down to is the fact that people are purchasing lifelong memories for their children. They're not actually purchasing a night on a floor. And when you put it in those terms, actually, it makes complete sense. The value of experience isn't just cultural, isn't just emotional, isn't just spiritual, it can be financial too. One of the things that doesn't need to cost a lot of money is the passion and enthusiasm of your volunteers and your staff. We invited um, James McClure, who is the chief exec of Airbnb UK, um, to come to our conference. And he said, when, when Airbnb were putting together their business case, one of the things that they found was, was this from TripAdvisor. People, your people, your vergers, your lay staff, your volunteers, make the difference between a good visit and an excellent visit. HR directors love this. But it also has the pack of authenticity because it comes from the private sector. The difference between a four-star TripAdvisor review, very good, and a five-star TripAdvisor review, excellent, is the intervention of a person. 
I went to St. James Piccadilly um, and I absolutely loved it, but I was culturally snacking. I popped in for 10 minutes, but had I not met the person who was at front of house who said, don't forget to see my top three favorite things, I don't think I would have had such a good experience. The mention of someone indicates that people make all the difference. And lastly, to remember and to be invited back, I love, do Google and have a look at Norwich Cathedral's My Cathedral hashtag and website. It's beautiful. And it encourages and enables people to say what they love about their cathedral as a building, as a, as a safe space, as a place of worship, as a place of faith. Do you genuinely, genuinely, give people permission to enter? Or does it depend what they look like? Or how old they are? Or their ability to walk across a door? Or a threshold? Genuinely? Permission to enter? Create partnerships with unusual suspects like Norwich and Dippy the Dinosaur, or Durham and Lego Cathedral, Bristol and the First World War celebrations, Salisbury and Magna Carta, York uh, Minster and its uh, garden last year at the Royal Horticultural Society Chelsea, which won the people's vote. York and the Northern Lights, and I'm just about to put up the picture again so it will frustrate you for the second time, and the IKEA Cathedral Cinema at Exeter just a couple of months ago. And this is what it looked like. Um, so this is Exeter Cathedral, and IKEA put in their own furniture, and they played two films to packed houses. One was Paddington 2, the other one was Dunkirk. It wasn't a double bill, because that would have been really weird. Um, <laughs> but absolutely packed out and fantastic. And I want to end again with, uh, that's a better picture, that's the Northern Lights at York Cathedral, uh, York Minster. Um, again, the kind of technology, affordable technology actually, that we now have, which are able to project astonishingly high resolution images onto buildings, as in Westminster Abbey at the beginning of uh, January, or indeed um, Durham Cathedral, where you saw the Lindisfarne Gospels projected onto the side of the building, or the sanctuary knocker uh, of the Great West Door. Um, that was a rousing final shot. It's, it's uh, slightly underwhelming, um, but do Google it. Um, and my final thought as I, I run out of time is tourism um, it, it is important. Um, it's important culturally. It's important economically. We, we know about the job creation aspects of it as well. But it's more important because you and your teams in your churches, as Bill was saying right at the beginning, you provide the backdrop for people's happiest memories. That's an incredible privilege. Cherish it. Be better at it. Welcome more people who don't look like you. You'll be amazed at the impact. You'll be amazed at the legacy. And you will be absolutely benefiting everybody in every community, in every constituency throughout the whole of the UK. Thank you very much for the invitation to come along here this morning.